Okay. Hello. 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 Oh. oh, there is a problem. Okay, that's with Ryan. Let me know that uh, we can uh, hear uh, the sound is okay. Okay, cool. Let me start. Uh, I'm really excited to be the uh, first presenter. It's a bit uh, weird to talk to an assistant, uh, to a crowd without uh, seeing you guys, but uh, um, I believe you're there. If you want to ping a message on the chat, it will be, give me a good feeling to feel that I'm not alone. Um, oh, Robert, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to be to be there. Um, we'll have a two-part uh, workshop about closure spec. The first one will start uh, just now, and then uh, I'll take a break for an hour. And after that, we will have the part two, as specified in the, in the schedule. Um, I just suggest that we start. So I will uh, try to share my screen. Press the button, screen share. Yeah application window here share okay okay no sorry just a second i have to open again the presentation in another uh, monitor in order to see your questions etc sorry from the just a second okay I hope that helped. That helped. That helped. Yeah. <laughs> but then I have then to use it. I don't know how to do that. So I have a technical issue because if I open the the uh, Chromecast in another tab, then I have the echo. So I don't know how to fix that. Uh, for the moment, I will just do my presentation. Okay, so waiting for Ryan to set up everything. And just a second, sorry. Oh, to turn the system audio, okay. Let me do that again, sorry. Let me reopen the tab. And let's see if it's better now. Okay, now echo, oh, black screen. I tried to share my screen, but for the moment it's not shared, just a black screen. Hmm. So let me start with an intro the introduction about the uh, closure spec, what is it? And when we uh, solve the, no, oh, just a second. Only black screen, yeah. Black screen. I tried to share my screen, but for some reason, the screen is not shared. Can be there now. Okay, we, I have to close the screen share. So, no. Okay, let me uh, close everything and reopen. Okay, and let me screen my share again. Application window, yeah, this one. Okay, I try to, sh oh, okay, much better. Uh, so can you see my, uh, okay. Uh, Cathy, I think it's better if you uh, display only my screen, no need to see my face, at least, at least not so big. Okay, wonderful. And now I have to find how to do a full screen. Sorry. Full. Okay, I don't know why it's not full screen. Let me try to do full screen. Okay, it's almost full screen. Never. Mind. Okay, so after all these technical issues, closure spec workshop part one, 
we, we, we are going to talk about uh, the foundation uh, of closure spec. Uh, this presentation is going to be live, so you are more than welcome to take this URL that is put that Ryan has put in the um, in the broadcast and to follow and to follow the slide uh, with me. Actually, if you open the presentation, you will see that here the time is not exactly that mine. I'm UTC plus two. And in your case, it should be uh, whatever time zone you are on. OK, so let's start. Uh, a bit of word about myself, who I am, who am I, a mathematician. Uh, I like to call myself a pragmatic uh, theorist, uh, meaning that I love to read the theoretical paper, but I also uh, love to implement them and to code. Uh, I'm a coder. I'm a freak of interactivity. I mean, I can I can barely learn something without uh, implementing it and um, playing with it, like in the in a wrapper in a REPL. And you will see that uh, this presentation will feature the embedded REPL. I hope you will enjoy it. Enjoy it. Uh, I love closure. A couple of years ago, I founded an audiology startup with thirty thousand lines of closure closure script code. And uh, back in the early 2016, I've developed uh, Clips, which is a JavaScript plugin to embed the live snippets into HTML pages and into presentations like this one. So you will uh, get a test of Clips in a couple of minutes. And I'm also a closure consul consultant. If you need to do hard stuff, feel free to call me, and I hope I will be able to help. OK. Uh, the agenda. Actually, it's a two-part workshop, but I split the slide into three parts because I don't know exactly uh, how long each of them will take. Uh, so we will have three uh, presentations, but it's really two topics. And for the first topic, we are going to talk a bit about what is uh, uh, closure, uh, what is closure spec, what's the big deal about it. Uh, we will not talk too much about the philosophy of closure spec. I, uh, I believe that you will get a sense of it with the code example. Uh, we will see the basic concept of closure spec, like confirm, validate, explain, etc., and much more. And uh, after we get familiar with this basic concept, we'll go get into deeper concepts, like sample generation based on the specs. Um, and uh, after that, this is this. Uh, we will see how with closure spec we can uh, generate not only data but also unit tests. So this will be part one, part one and a half. And after that, we will see in part two in uh, about two hours how to write defend like macros using closure spec. Okay. So yeah, just before we start, please, 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 please take this URL and open it in your browser. Uh, if you're on a desktop or laptop, it's, it's great. If you're on mobile, uh, it will work. Uh, you can, if you are watching this uh, presentation on the video, I mean, after it's uh, published, you can scan this QR code and you'll be able to follow the presentation. And as I said, all the interactive code snippets of this presentation are powered by Clips, which is my tool. And Clips is uh, the thing that allows these interactive code snippets, like this, map ink one, two, three, four, five, six. See, I'm playing with the code, and it is uh, evaluated as I type. Here is my code, and here is the result. And this is how we are going to work during these uh, two uh, workshops. I will show you a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of code examples. So if you open your the presentation in your browser, you will be able to play by yourself with the code. So instead of asking me uh, what's go what will happen if I modify the code like this or like that, or it seems that you have a bug in your code, or it seems that I can implement what you said in a better way, feel free to play with, with, the, with that in your browser. OK, let's start. So closure spec, you have probably uh, heard about the closure spec. It is the big, big thing of closure 1.9. On one side, it's a, a library, so it's not a modification of the internals of the language, uh, but it's a very, very powerful library, which is uh, really well integrated 
with the uh, foundation of the language. So what is ClojureSpec? ClojureSpec is a library that allows you to specify the structure of your data. Sometimes we say the shape of your data. Um, as you guys probably uh, know or have experienced, if you have coded something in Clojure or Clojure script, uh, the, this is a dynamically typed language. And the most uh, famous uh, way to share, to, to use data is with HashMap. HashMap is great. It's like a JSON, it's like a dictionary, key values, and the keys can, could be anything, and the values could be anything, keyword, string, symbol, function, array, set, etc., whatever. So it's very convenient when you write uh, your code, but at the time when you want uh, other people to use your code or maybe yourself uh, after a couple of months, it might become a mess because you don't remember exactly what is the shape of your data. And sometimes uh, stuff is broken just because you didn't pass the argument to the function the way it was supposed to receive it. You've probably written a documentation, a doc string to your function, but you have not uh, kept you have not kept it up to date and it becomes a mess and it's really really hard to to it becomes really uh, painful when the, your project goes and bigger and it it might be considered as a weak point if you compare closure with uh, statically typed languages and you will see we will see today that closure spec is uh, an answer to this objection so closure spec provides you a way to specify the shape of your data it allows you, once you have specified the shape of your data, to validate your data. I mean, to, you have data, you have spec, you can check whether the data is uh, valid according to the specification. This is one thing, it's called validation, but there is something even more powerful, which is called conforming. Sometimes we say parsing or destructuring. We will see that in a moment. And once you have, so there is two directions between spec and data. You can write a spec that specify the shape of your data in order to validate the data, but you can do it the other way. Once you have specification, you can ask spec to give you samples of data based on the specification. This is what we call data generation. And on top of it, you can do even better. Once you have a function that is supposed to receive the data in a specific shape, you can ask closure spec to uh, test your function almost without having to write uh, any line of code. So it's a lot of uh, stuff that has been summarized in those five points. And by the end of the uh, part two of the Closure Spec Workshop, I hope that you will appreciate how much, uh, how powerful is uh, Closure Spec. Okay. And in order to enjoy all these beautiful features, the only thing that you have to do is to include the Closure Spec namespace into your project like this. Okay. Let's start. So uh, we will go over the syntax. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask. I, I'm trying to look at um, both screen and I might be able to receive questions. And if someone wants to ask a question uh, with his voice, he's also more than welcome. So uh, the basic uh, way to define a spec is with S dev, as is an alias for the closure spec namespace. OK, so S. So here I'm defining a spec named ID, and ID is must be an integer. Here I'm defining another spec named name, which must be which must be a string. Okay, I pass. I can pass uh, any predicate that I want, uh, not only the predicate that are already implemented in Clojure. A predicate is just a function that returns a boolean, either true or false. For example, let's try to write a predicate for a big integer. So in order to be a big integer, I have to be an integer and I have to be uh, greater than uh, 1 million. So this is my predicate and my big integer is the spec for this predicate. Uh, similarly, I can define a short string. String with count, whose count is less than five. Simple enough. Okay. Uh, if you have paid attention, you have seen this double column here. I will explain what is it. It is mandatory in spec. If you forget it, if you try to define a spec with a single column, you will see uh, this error because the keyword must be namespace. I will explain what are namespace keywords. 
So name, namespace keywords are just keywords, but namespace, okay? What does it mean namespace? It means that the keyword is as two parts, the namespace slash the name of the keyword. And the double column is a syntactic sugar for the current namespace. So you see if here we are in food.com namespace. And when I use double column hello, actually it's read as food.com slash hello. In closure spec, uh, the, when you define a spec, you must use a namespace keyword. And the reason for that is that because all of this, all the specs that you define are registered into a global registry. So if you define, you would have defined a non-namespace keyword, it, it uh, would have been a big mess. Okay, so once you have defined a spec, what can you do with your spec? You can validate. So for example, if you remember, we had the ID spec, which is an integer. If I pass an integer, this, the, I can ask spec to validate, and here it's valid. If I pass something that is not an integer, like a string, I will get invalid. Again, feel free to play with, please play with the code snippets. It's for you. Don't be lazy. Open uh, a new tab of your browser with this URL. You can find it in the, uh, below the video. Okay, uh, it works also with our custom predicates. It's valid, this one is not valid. Okay, but one, if, uh, if data is valid according to respect, that's fine. But if data is not valid, I'd like to know why it's not valid. For example, this ABC is not a valid my big integer because it's not an integer. And this 17 number is not valid, not because it's not an integer, but, bec but because it's not a big integer. Is spec able to give me the details about the validation failure? You will see that yes. For that purpose, you have this amazing function, explain or explain str, explain output the data to the console, explain str returns the data as a string. So let's see what happens when I pass ABC, a string, uh, to uh, explain str with a non-valid spec. I see val ABC fail spec because it doesn't satisfy the predicate. Hmm. That's not so useful. I know that it doesn't pass the predicate, but I'd like to know what part of the predicate was not satisfied. So in order to enjoy this feature, we need to uh, define better our spec. If you remember, when we define my big integer, we used our own composition. We add a function. Let me see if I can find it. We add a function here, not this one. Sorry, this one. And we use the regular and macro in order to compose the, our two conditions. But this is from spec, spec perspective, it's just a one predicate, one function. So spec has no real way to, to detect what part of the predicate was not satisfied. But for that purpose, there is the end macro of spec. So S slash N. This is how you are supposed to compose predicates. So my so now big integer without the my prefix, it's a spec composed by the conjunction of integer and, and something that is greater than a million. And now that we have done that, if we pass something that is not an integer, you will see val ABC fails because this part of the this predicate failed the integer. And if I pass a small number, you will see that this predicate failed. So that's much 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 more useful. And uh, you will see that you're able to compose very, very uh, complex or nested specs. So that's really useful to be able to see what part of the spec was not satisfied. Uh, the same for short string, when it's not a string, and when it's a long string. Okay, simple enough. Any questions so far? No, okay, let's continue, let's move on. So like the SN, there is SR. There is something a bit tricky with SR, I'll try to explain. And it will become uh, even clearer when we um, move forward with other examples. So for example, let's say I want to have a spec that is either, that validates something that is either a big integer or a short string. For that, I will use the OR predicate. Uh, but in the OR, OR predicate is like, uh, you can, uh, 
you can uh, see the OR function or, or the OR operator like a branch uh, branch operator. So there are two parts of, in this case, there are two parts of the branch, two branches, sorry, either a big integer or short string. In spec, you must give identifiers to each branch. Um, so here, the big integer is labeled as column as keyword in, and the short string is labeled as keyword str. The reason for that is that when something fails, you will want to know in what part, in what branch of the spec it has failed. For example, if I pass something that is neither a big integer nor a short string, like this hello world, you will see that, that spec will tell you what is the path of the failure. So this is the path of the failure. Um, and we'll see with a more complex example, the path uh, might be really, really complex if you write a deeply nested uh, spec. So it's uh, mandatory to, with the OR operator to, to, to label your branches. Okay, so, so far so good. We have seen how to define a spec, how to compose specs with AND and OR, how to validate spec, how to get explanation about spec failures. Now we will see how to pass our data with spec. For that purpose, you need to use the conform function. And let's see what conform does. So here I have something that is a valid uh, big integer or short string. It's a big number. Uh, and when I conform, conform is like parsing. I will get the, the like, if you want the abstract syntax tree or the, the tree that describes the shape of my data. We'll see later why, why, why it is so useful. For the moment, just get used. I want you guys to get used to the syntax and to the, the, to the semantics. So for here was for big integer or short string, short string. And again, it uses the, the branch label that we have seen before in the OR uh, operator. So the, the label are used, are used all, uh, by explain and also by conform in order to get the syntactic representation of your data. And if you pass something that is, uh, that is not valid according to your spec, you will get an invalid answer. And if you, um, let's see what happens if we go uh, uh, another level of nesting. For example, we define something that uh, my special spec that could be either a keyword or a big integer or a short string. And you will see that when you pass something that is a big integer or a short string, uh, when you conform it, you will see exactly the path of your AA, to what part of the spec it conforms. Okay. So until now, we have seen uh, a couple of ways to define specs for uh, data. And there are plenty of predicates uh, already available in uh, closure spec. And we will see more of them during this presentation. Now, if we want to specify the shape or the structure of, your, of a map, uh, you need to specify what are the keys that are allowed in your map not exactly a lot, what keys are required and what keys are optional. And once you define a key uh, either required as optional, uh, there will be a matching between the name of the key and the spec. So for example, here I'm defining a spec for my map and I'm specifying that big integer is a required key with a double column. And not only it is required to appear in my map, but the value that is associated with big integer must be valid according to the big integer spec. And the same for the short string. The short string might maybe not appear in my map, which is fine because it's optional, but if it appears, it must be valid according to the short string spec. Let's see an example to make it clearer. So for example, this one is valid because this is a big integer and this is a short string. But if, let, uh, let's take a look at this one. This one is not valid for two reasons. First reason, this one is not a big integer, it's 90. And this one, hello world, is not a short string, it's a long string. And as we saw before, explain STR will give you detailed explanation about what went wrong. So 1990 failed because it's, 
It's not a big integer. And why it's not a big integer? Because it doesn't satisfy this predicate. And the same for hello world. It's, it doesn't, it fails the spec short string. And what part of the, uh, what part of the short string fail? It's this predicate. So I hope that you are starting to appreciate how much um, facilities are given to you with, by closure spec to understand exactly what went wrong with your data. Let's move on. Okay, now that's a tricky question. Uh, so here is big integer or short string, okay, which was not part of my definition of the map. So, so this key is neither required nor optional. So why does it fail? You could argue that it fails because uh, the key is not uh, it's need it's not part of the specification of my map, but actually that's not the reason. And I will show you that if I make this integer big enough so that it satisfies this spec, now the whole map is a valid. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry for the confusion. Here I have. S keys with nothing required and nothing optional. And all, although, however, okay, sorry, let's go back to the beginning, to my first example. So here I have a spec for an empty map. And although I've not specified uh, this key, neither as required nor as optional, spec will check whether 90 satisfies this spec. Um, and if it's not satisfied, the whole map will not be valid. But if it's satisfied, when the number becomes big enough, then it will become valid. So even this, even uh, although this key was not part of the keys specified here, spec will validate. So it's like every key is optional. So you might ask yourself, why do we need opt at all? I mean, if everything is uh, validate according to the uh, according to the spec that correspond to the key. So why do I have to uh, specify that something is optional? Is everything is optional? I will leave you with that question. And when we talk about test generation, we will get an answer to this question. Um, okay. Now you can. Sometimes you don't want to work with namespace keyword. You want to work with n namespace keyword. And there is a mechanism uh, built in inside spec. So you use the rec, rec n and the opt n. And now you, you pass big integer with single column. So it's a non namespace keyword. And it will be also validated uh, according to the big integer spec. So exactly the same example as before. The only difference is that if you pass something 90, for example, it's not a valid big integer or short string. Uh, in this case, it's valid because only the namespace qualified keys are validated by any registered spec. Uh, maybe it's uh, something advanced, but if you go back to this presentation after you have played with spec, you will understand what I meant here. Let's move on. Okay, so for the moment we have seen how to define uh, the simple predicate, how to define predic uh, spec for maps. Now we'll see how to define uh, uh, specs for sequences. Uh, as you know, Clojure is a Lisp language, and the basic uh, struct data structure for Lisp is list, list or sequences. And in spec, there is a mechanism called regular expression. It's, uh, it resembles the regular expression that you are probably used to, uh, the string regular expression that you can find in any language. So it's the same syntax, but it's for sequences. And there are five uh, basic operators that I will go into them. So there is the cat for concatenation of predicates and patterns. There is the alt, which is like all, when you have a choice among uh, alternative predicates or patterns. There is the star when you want a repetition that could be zero. There is a plus when you want repetition, which is one or more, one or more, sorry. 
and there is the question mark for zero or one predicate. So it, behave, it behaves almost like regular, like string re, uh, regular expression, but there are a couple of differences that we will go over now. Let's take a look at, at an example. For example, let's define an employee. An employee is going to be a sequence with a name, and the name could be either a string or a tuple made of two strings. And if it's a string, I will label it as full. And if it's a tuple with first and last, first and last name, I will label it as first and last. And also, uh, there is to an employee has a salary, and the salary must be a big integer. So this is my spec named employee. Now let's see uh, how does it work. So for example, here is a sequence for a non-valid employee. Why it's not valid, we will see in a minute. In this sequence, you have a string and an integer. And if you ask spec to explain you what went wrong, you will see that at salary, at this part of the spec, this part of the predicate was not satisfied. And if you increase the salary of John Who, he will be happy and spec also will be happy. And the same here. Uh, okay, so this is about explain. Now, if you want to conform, okay, if you want to conform this sequence, uh, I remember you that conforming to pass it, you will get a very um, detailed abstract syntax tree that describes your data according to the specification that you gave here with all the label that you gave here. So we will have a name and inside the name there is first and last and we have also a salary in our syntax tree. And if you think about it, it's not so easy to take a sequence of, of data and to transform it into an abstract syntax tree, but it's really, really useful and powerful. Let's take a look at a more advanced uh, example. Any questions so far? Because until now it was pretty uh, simple and straightforward. Oh, I saw example here. Sorry, I saw a question by JF Rompri. What is the difference between SR and S alt? Oh, that's a really, really, uh, um, okay, that's a really, really interesting question. And I asked it, I asked myself this question and I got an answer. Uh, I think that I will answer it in a moment with a special uh, example. Basically, if you are inside a regular expression, you probably you want to use alt. Uh, if you are outside the regular expression, I think you cannot use alt, you must use or. But you can use or inside regular expression. And the difference is that the part that is wrapped into an or will be wrapped in order to be valid, should be wrapped into a sequence. So for example, let me take an example here. One, two, three, four. So if you want it to be valid, you need to specify this part with or. If you specify with alt, it will be valid only if it flies. OK, very good question. And I agree with you that it is not clear at all from the documentation. OK, so sorry, let's go back to. Uh, OK, now we are going to build a simplified version of the arts of DEFN. So DEFN is probably the most used macro, is how you define function in uh, non anonymous function in uh, Clojure. And DEFN, if you think about it, it has a couple of ways to receive its argument. Let's take a look at part of it, not all of them. So the, the arguments of DEFN should be a name, which is mandatory, and the name must be a symbol. Then there is a doc string, which is a string, but it's optional. The doc string might appear and it might also not appear. And after that, we have the args, which is basically a collection of symbol, and it's it must be a vector. It cannot be a, a sequence or a map. And there is also the body that I didn't put here. So um, let's take a look at an example. 
Okay, so if we take a look at this args, at this sequence, it's a valid argument to def and arg because the first one is a symbol, the second one is a string, and the third, third one is the argument of the function. As I said, I omitted the body to make it uh, simpler. And if you uh, don't pass a doc string, it's also valid. And wh what is nice is that conform will work in both cases and it will return you uh, an object that describes exactly what what uh, data, uh, I mean, what is the structure of your data that you receive? And if you wanted by yourself to try to receive this uh, sequence and to decide whether the second one was a string or uh, an arg, etc., to pass it by itself, it will be very, very complicated. And actually, if you look at the code of def n or let, you will probably see uh, a lot of complex code that might be refactored in a very elegant way using closure spec. Okay, and now let's take a look at uh, the fn args. Okay, so no, I, I suggest we skip this example. It's an advanced example. You might take a look uh, by yourself, but I don't want to get into too complex details now. Okay. Okay, what's the difference between alt and or, as you asked? So the answer is not here. I will uh, add it later. I have uh, something that shows ex an example of exactly what is the difference. Okay, one last thing that is very nice. Once you have defined a spec, no matter how complex it is, you can describe it programmatically. So for example, our spec FNR, which is pretty complex, uh, closure spec provide a way to uh, for humans to take a look at those specs, which is nice. Okay, so what have we learned so far? We have learned about the language of specs definition, how to define specs, how to validate, to confirm, to explain a spec, and I hope that you have started to get uh, a sense of the power of expression that is given to you developers with close respect. Here are a couple of references with all the details and articles about uh, close respect. You might want to take a look at it uh, after that. Question, please. We are not at the end of the presentation. We have uh, another 20 minutes to go, but if you have questions uh, so far, I will be happy to take them. If not, we can move to the data generation with closure spec. Okay. I will pass to Ryan the URL for this slide. Oh, sorry, I saw a question here. Um, Oh. Suppose I need to validate relationships between keys in a map, like start time is before end time. Yes, yes, you can do that, Stefan. Um, definitely, the um, the specification are runtime specification, and it's not as you you uh, we saw. It's not limited to uh, types. You can match to what you can uh, validate against whatever you want. And there is a way also to uh, use different parts of the spec. Mm -hmm. The way to do that, yeah, let's try to do it. Let's do something uh, a bit scary, scary, live coding. So let's go back to a simple entity map. Let's try, hopefully it will work. Mm -hmm. Entity maps. Yeah, that was here. Okay, so for example, you say if you want, uh, let's try to define something like that AAA, that you want keys uh, required. Let's say you want A and B. And you want some relationships between A and B. 
Is that uh, what you want, uh, Stephanie? Okay, so the way to do that will be to, um, to do something like that. Is end. If you use end, I think that you can do, you can pass here a function. Uh, let's make an anonymous function. Here, the what you get here will be the see. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we got here. X print X. Okay. So now, if you want to check if A one B two. It's false. And if we want to explain, okay, we didn't define. Okay, we have to define. Okay, let's make it any. Same for B. Any, any means anything. Now it's it's valid, but I wanted to see the. Hmm. Sorry, I have to have the parenthesis problem. Um, let's see what happens if I return true. Hmm. Oh, sorry, A, not A, A, A and B. So we double column A, yeah. So this one is valid. And if I pass false, this one is not valid. And if I print, what is X? We'll see that X is this guy. So it's the conformed spec. It's the, the conformed data. So now you can say, um, let's make sure that Okay. Yeah, so here you go, Stephen. I think you you got your answer. So you can pass to N uh, a sequence of predicates and each of them will receive the confirmed data from the previous one. So this one will take the map and pass it as is. And this one will receive the map and can do any validation that it wants. Cool. Uh, what is the difference between closure spec and CLG spec, Dave? So obviously CLG spec is only for closure. The, the real namespace of spec inside closure script is CLGS.spec. CLGS but in closure script, there is a mechanism that allows you to uh, name a closure CLGS namespace with the closure prefix. So closure.set, closure.string, closure.spec, closure.test, etc. You can either, when you are in closure script, you can either use closure.spec or clgs.spec. It's uh, preferable to use the closure.spec version because it's more portable. Then you don't have to use different codes for closure and closure script. Okay. Let's move on. All to name specs for datomic schema. Uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, data generation with closure spec. Or to share specs between front end and back end. Um, what do you mean? You mean if you want over the wire to pass specs or if you want to have the same code in the front end and the back end with CLJC? Can you specify, uh, precise your question, uh, Thomas? Mm -hmm. Nothing for the moment. Oh, I have added a comment, sorry. Since they are usually in different repos, uh, yeah, it's a very specified question. Maybe we can take it offline. It will be hard for me to, to answer uh, this way. 
Okay, let's move on to the data generation. Okay, this is again for people who will catch this slide. So now we are going to take to talk about uh, data generation based on the specs, how to, there is a special mechanism to specking your function and to test your function. Again, please, please, I beg you, all the lazy people that didn't, that haven't opened their browser yet, please, please open your browser. You will really enjoy more of the presentation. And again, there is a QR code for people watching this video after uh, it has been released to the public domain. You can use the QR code from your mobile to, um, okay, now, um, now, uh, if you want to deal with data generation, you need to add a couple of namespaces, the closure spec.test and the closure spec impel gen. Uh, in closure, it's a bit different. I think it's without the impel here. This is a, a specific closure spec, spec uh, closure script, sorry, artifact. Um, Okay, so let's take again our uh, specs, big integer, short string, big integer or short string, and let's see what we can do with them. So out of a spec, I can retrieve the generator associated to the spec. And once I have the generator, I can sample uh, data according to this generator. And I can specify how much data, data I want, five, six, seven, can rerun it, control enter, and get big integer. It's really fun, it's like a game. Yeah, to open the thumbnail, you need to press the M button. Uh, that was a question by Dan. Okay. Uh, Okay, and there is a shortcut for it. It's not really a shortcut because it doesn't do exactly the same thing, but there is an exercise function when you don't need to wrap with the fgen. And here you will get both the data and the conform uh, tree. So for example, S exercise with big integer of short string, I want five of, of them, I can again, seven, eight, nine. Here you will see, you will get a sequence of vector. This is the data. And this is the conform data, as we talked about before. So if you run conform on this data, this is what you will get. Okay, so far so good. Oh, you remember that question that I asked? Why, when you use the S keys uh, function, do you need to specify optional keys? Now it becomes clear, it relates to uh, data generation. For example, if I have a map with big integer as required keys, when I want to sample data, I will get only uh, maps that contains this key, big integer. My playground is the name of my name. And if I specify an optional key, short string, then spec, when I ask him to generate data, it will generate data with short string as an optional key. So the first one has the short string, the second one also, the third one doesn't have short string, the fourth also not, etc. So that's the, maybe not the only, but the main reason why optional key is important. Also, for, obviously, for documentation perspective, it's really uh, helpful to your user of your function or your library. They, they might know what are optional and what is not optional. But from a validation perspective, uh, <coughs> keys that appear in the optional list and keys that don't appear in the optional list are both validated. So that's important to remember. What's an example when you would use exercise? Drew. Yeah, so first of all, um, you want to use exercise when uh, at development time in, in the REPL, when you want to, to see example of uh, data. For and we'll see that uh, the test 
test generation mechanism. Uh, based on spec views, kind of, uh, not for debug. Yeah, for when you want to debug your spec, if you don't understand why, why your spec will see what went wrong. Okay, so let's see, there is a special, um, some issues. Are there people that don't have sound issues? One, two, three. Three, four, five, six. Side to improve it. Okay. Let me see if I, I can stop something. Okay. Choose. Um, I don't know what to do. Is there a way for me to improve it? MC, please, Katie, please help. Oh, sound is perfect for Rudy. So probably it's an issue with the it's better, Angus. Sound good in a strike. Yeah. Breaking up. Uh, the transatlantic cable went down. Bad in Hong Kong. Uh, hmm. Bad in Australia. Yeah, for way. Uh, can you guys hear me? Is the sound better now? Please? Much better. Okay. Um, yeah, Cathy, please bring only, okay, one screen, great. Uh, the sound is better? Uh, better so far, seems to be back here. Okay, so let's continue. Let's see, we have, um, so we have five minutes left. Um, no, this is not the good one. Speaking the argument. Yeah, and we have uh, four slides to cover. So let's try to do it. Um, let's try to do it and to see how we can specify. Hmm. Okay, so how many time is left, uh, Ryan? Uh, do we have only five minutes? 
more or we can take a bit of okay five minutes okay so let's let's try to to use these five minutes um and if we cannot uh, complete uh, everything we will uh, wrap up from here on uh, from where we li live for the part two okay so let's let's imagine we have a function an addition function that does regular addition but will bound the result between an upper and lower bound so this function it's not an amazing function but from a it receives as argument a b the numbers and also a map describing the upper bound and the lower bound okay this is the implementation of this, my function hopefully i don't have too much too many bags okay so let's specify the uh, spec for the upper and the lower and the argument so upper must be a number lower must be a number and now you see here i'm using fdef because it's the definition the spec definition of the function of bounded addition it's a macro so i don't need to pass the function as a symbol and i can specify the shapes for the argument as a sequence so the argument of my function is a sequence of length three a b c and i'm going to specify uh, what each part of the sequence should how each part of the sequence should look like so the first part that i will name a can name it whatever i want here it has no relation with the a that is used here but for the convenience i will name it a a must be a number b must be a number and this map that i will name boundaries it's a map with two required keys that are and namespace upper and lower and upper and lower must satisfy the spec that, has, that are defined here. Upper is a number and lower is a number. Okay, now let's see what happens if I pass wrong argument to the function. So uh, if I decide to instrument the function, so the bounded addition function, and now I have to pass the symbol with the syntax code. If I decide to instrument it, and I call bounded addition with bad arguments, I will get a, a runtime error with exactly an explanation about what went wrong with the data. Reason insufficient output input, because I pass just one parameter. If I pass more parameters, here you will see another failure. Uh, the problem is that at this pass, args, boundaries, so here, the third part of my spec, the predicate map was not satisfied. So, and here, uh, here it must contain lower, and it doesn't contain lower. So, and lower is the required keys in my map. So you you see that when the function is instrumented, uh, I can check. I can check at runtime. I can make sure that. My before the code of my function runs, it is validated by spec, which is uh, should be really really powerful for error uh, validation. And you can also you can instrument and instrument. I don't know if it's a real English word. Maybe it's a neolo neologism neologism made by ClojureScript guys. Anyway, when the bounded function when the sorry when the bounded addition function is instrumented, then I call it and everything goes well from the spec perspective but uh, obviously this function doesn't run it does it doesn't return any number because it's a closure script which is built on top of javascript and javascript is very tolerant to error i don't get any exception runtime exception so you can if i instrument back you will see the error and this comes to the very interesting question and i will leave you guys with this so what is the default? When I don't instrument and when I don't instrument, what is the default? And I will let you with this question. We'll leave you with it. And we have 30 seconds. Uh, I don't think we have time to, um, to take any questions. Um, so I guess that's it. Thank you guys for uh, being here. Um, and I'll see you back in uh, an hour or so for the part two of the close spec workshop. We will uh, wrap up from here.